Okay, well, maybe we better, we better get started, though. Um, no, unfortunately, I, I've come in ill-prepared to do an introduction. I wasn't expecting to do an introduction. But first of all, just uh, to thank everyone for, for coming. I think it's a very uh, eclectic and unusual bunch of people here, um, which is interesting in its own way, which is, is a great testament to, uh, to your power to draw a, a crowd, um, Graham. Um, so I think it's interesting from the point of view of the um, how your work is at the intersection of a number of different fields and a number of different interests. Um, from our point of view here, within the business school, we're interested in issues around technology and social and organisational change and how we think about technology and how we talk about technology. Um, and obviously we've been very influenced by the work of Bruno Latour um, and, um, and so we've been drawing attention to your work through, through your Prince of Networks and so on. Um, and obviously from, from a philosophical point of view as well, uh, there's been a, an interest in, in Heideggerian perspectives on tools and technology and so on. And so I think for, for, for us, you're, you bring together these things in, in a wonderful way and in a very accessible way as well, which is wonderful in terms of, of, um, of uh, from some of the stuff that I've, that I've read uh, of, of your work. So um, first of all, is, is welcome to Dublin, and um, we're looking forward to to, um, to hearing you uh, talk and maybe fill out some of, some of your writings. And um, so I think the interesting thing about the audience is that many people here don't have a very strong philosophical background. On the other hand, there's plenty of professional philo philosophers here as well. So um, uh, so it'd be interesting to see the, how how the uh, how the different sides respond as well. So thanks very much for, for coming, Graham, and. Um, uh, and also just to tell people as well that there's a follow-up workshop on Monday, I think at 2 o'clock as well in this particular room, where we will have an opportunity to explore some of these issues in a more informal uh, perspective. Uh, um, and, uh, yes. Thanks very much, and I really enjoy these eclectic crowds, and many of my best conversations in recent years have been at business schools. And I think that's actually a testament to Bruno Latour and his power as an interdisciplinary trailblazer. Essentially, any department in which Latour is read is one in which I can speak. And so I'm following behind Latour and profiting from the, the pass he's, he's laid for us. Um, I was asked to prepare something fairly informal today. So what I have are notes. And the problem with notes is that you're never sure whether you have too much or not enough. And so I'm going to have to keep one eye on my watch here as I go along. And I'm also aware of the problem you pointed to, that there's different levels of philosophical reading in the room. So I'll try to strike a middle tone on the philosophy. It's going to be metaphysics. I can't get away from that, but I have tried to do a good job in presenting metaphysical issues to broad publics in the past. And in fact, I wrote Heidegger Explained, which was a book aimed at my grandmother, who's not even a university graduate. And I think I also appealed to some professional Heideggerians with that book. So it's, it's an exercise that I enjoy, trying to appeal to different crowds simultaneously. OK. But 45 minutes or so, okay, that's what I'll aim for. The title I gave to Potter was A New Theory of Substance, and that's following many of my recent efforts to try to be somewhat provocative, because the term substance is very out of fashion now in philosophy, just as the term essence is out of fashion. And in fact, the term I usually use in my own work is objects, but I from time to time use substance to try to show that there is some traditional continuity there, that we don't have to completely throw out the traditional model of, of uh, substance. But the term I've been using for about 10 years is object-oriented philosophy, um, built by analogy, obviously, with the phrase object-oriented programming in computer science. Um, and my background comes from the joint influence of first Heidegger. For a whole decade, I was reading Heidegger, Heidegger, Heidegger all the time. And suddenly, at the end of that period, encountering Latour very suddenly, about 11 years ago, who was very different in tone from Heidegger. And yet, there are some points of interface that are pretty obvious. And I would say that objects are currently fairly unpopular in my tribe of continental philosophers, which in a way is a shame, because if you look at both Husserl and Heidegger, really the two foundational figures in the movement, objects play a central role in both. You have intentional objects in Husserl. You could say Husserl is in many ways giving us an object-oriented model of consciousness for the first time in a mature form, and Heidegger, the tool analysis, and later the essays on the thing, where individual objects really are important for Heidegger in a way that they haven't been for other philosophers since Kant. So, uh, in a way, I think a return to objects in continental philosophy will be a return to our roots, the deepest roots of the movement, and this is what I always try to encourage. The video is on, right? Just so I know? Okay. Um, object is usually opposed in philosophy to subject. You have the human subject here, and then there's a world of objects outside, and so it's there, therefore linked with a certain kind of realism, which I also support. I consider myself a realist. But the term is actually a lot broader than that. 
object isn't just something that exists in opposition to subject. It, it can also be opposed to a number of other things. For example, you can say an object is something different from its relations, that I can move to different points around the table and still be the same person, or find out that one of my brothers is not my real brother and still be the same person. So I, somehow an object should be something different from its relations, sort of things. An object should be different from its accidents. Whether I wear this jacket or another jacket or comb my hair slightly differently, I should be the same object. Uh, an object could differ from its own qualities, meaning that even if it needs its qualities to be what it is, it's somehow a unity over and above those qualities. You could say that an object is different from its essential moments. And finally, especially if you're an anti-reductionist, as I am, you could say an object is different from its parts. That just putting the parts together doesn't explain what the thing is, but it's something emergent over and above those parts. You could say any of these things, or you could deny them. And in fact, most of the radical moves in philosophy involve denying one of those oppositions and saying, there isn't really an object, it's nothing more than X or Y. And I'll give you some examples of those. You have, for example, Latour, my favorite living philosopher, uh, with whom I have this one major disagreement, which is that for him, an, uh, an object is nothing more than its relations. It's nothing more than how it transforms, perturbs, creates, changes, affects, I've forgotten the exact phrase. It affects on other things, uh, is what makes a thing real. For Whitehead also, you, you, to talk about a thing outside of its relations would be what he calls vacuous actuality, which he means in a completely negative sense. You cannot say that there's some substance there outside of how it's apprehending other things. And the tour is really inheriting that point from Whitehead. So that's one example of a radical denial that an object is anything more than its relations or its effects on other things. Another even more famous example would be David Hume, where an object is just a bundle of qualities. There really isn't an object there. You think you're eating an apple, you're actually just seeing sweet and green and slippery and smooth and shiny, cold, hard, and then you're sort of imagining maybe there's some substrate bundling all those qualities together. And then in idealism, or in what Quentin Meassou, the rising new French philosopher, calls correlationism, which is where this human and the world always exist in mutual correlation and not apart from each other, the object is just the way it presents itself to us. It's not some spooky thing in itself hiding beyond that relation, but exists totally within the correlation. Those are three examples of how objects are denied, but there's yet another one which is becoming even more cutting edge and fashionable, and that is uh, this retreat to something beneath objects instead of something above objects, the pre-individual realm. You see this, for example, in Simon Don, who's starting to become more popular as the Deleuze wave begins to slowly ebb. Um, back, Giordano Bruno, back in Renaissance times, is someone who says that there is this uh, kind of universal matter from which forms emerge temporarily and then sink back in. So what's real is something deeper than the objects. And the objects are kind of surface encrustations of this deeper matter uh, that are not real things compared to this deeper matter. Um, Manuel de Landa, uh, one of the great Deleuzeans in the present day uh, thinks that individual objects are simply frozen actualities and what's really, what's genuine are these topological structures that are deeper than any particular actualization. So for him, for example, vertebrates uh, is something deeper than its actualization in any specific vertebrates. Uh, individual animals are not real for Delanda in the same way that a topological structure is like vertebrates, a, a genus. And finally, even in the tour, we're seeing a bit of slippage into this in his recent works. In Reassembling the Social, he says that there's this thing called the plasma, that beneath all the formatted networks, there's this giant plasma that's unformatted, and this is what explains all change. It's kind of like traditional matter that the tour is retreating to, that why does the Soviet empire collapse overnight? Why do companies go bankrupt without a hint? It's because there's this plasma underneath that allows formatted things to dissolve and take on new forms. And he says it's, it's big, uh, the size of this plasma compared to networks, is as big as all of London compared to the London Underground, which is a surprising statement from the tour. It tends to think of everything being uh, developed in networks that are fully actualized and, and fully determinate. So we'll see what, what the tour does with that. He's still at work. He's still working on his magnum opus. We'll see what happens with this concept when the book is finally published, I guess, next year. Modes of existence. So these are all what you could call radical philosophies, because they're all trying to reduce the world to a single radix, a single root, and, and say that uh, actually objects are just a, an empty supposition over and above the relations, or over and above the bundle of qualities, or over and above the formless, churning matter that everything emerges from. Uh, and I would oppose all of these radical philosophies in favor of, for lack of a better term, what I would call a polarized philosophy, where you have to, to take account of both of the poles and show how they interact. You can't just say that there's no substance, there are only qualities. You have to show how the qualities inhere in a substance or how they are somehow belonging to a substance, yet somehow independent as well. 
But there are, of course, a number of problems with traditional substance that lead people to, to drop it, and I wouldn't want to replicate these either. And these are best seen, I think, in my favorite philosopher, Leibniz, who uh, includes all of these bad features of substance that I would also not wish to continue. For example, it's often assumed that, that substance has to be natural. And for Leibniz, it had to be created at the beginning of time. You can't say that an army is a substance. You can't say that a machine is a substance. These are mere aggregates for Leibniz. Uh, they're eternal for Leibniz. Substances cannot be destroyed. They're created by God at the beginning of time, these monads, and they are not destroyed. It would be an illogical waste of energy for God to destroy them later. A dead animal would simply revert to a tinier form, an invisible form, a weaker form, but would not be destroyed. And that loses, I think, one of Aristotle's best insights. I think Aristotle must have been the first Greek philosopher not to say that substance had to be eternal. I can't think of an earlier one. Uh, the others, whether they thought it was a physical element or whether they thought it was the formless aperon that everything emerged from, uh, or that it was numbers, I don't recall that any of the others said that substance could be destroyed. Uh, in Aristotle, it can. It doesn't have to be eternal. And also in Leibniz, substance has to be simple. Even though it has many qualities, it has to be a simple thing, which means you have one final layer of substances. You can't have substances built out of substances built out of substances in a chain, which you can, for example, in Latour. Latour's theory of black boxes is that UCD can be an actor, and individual parts of UCD can be actors. You know, say the buildings and the parts of the buildings can be actors, and the people inside the building can be, buildings can be actors, and so on and so on. It can go down to infinity for the tour. There's not one final layer where you reach substance. Whereas in Leibniz, you still have this two-world theory where everything's either a substance or it's an aggregate. And uh, that's another thing I don't like. Uh, to give some of Leibniz's examples, he says that, uh, you know, of course, horses and trees can be substances, but the Dutch East India Company, no. A circle of men holding hands, no. Uh, he also says that a diamond can be a substance, but a pair of diamonds glued together cannot be, which is surprising given how much work it takes to make a diamond out of its raw form, how much polishing has to go on, and what kind of arbitrary cuts that might be made uh, to give it its, its final size. He still thinks an individual diamond can be a substance, but a pair cannot. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned the tourist black boxes. So that's, that's sort of the background to the paper, that I am a fan of the traditional concepts of substance if you subtract those features that I consider to be arbitrary. You, I'm a fan of objects, really. Things that have some autonomy from their relations, from their qualities, from their moments, from their parts, and cannot be reduced to any of those things. I'm really as strong an anti-reductionist as you can be. I don't think you can reduce objects to any of those features or any of those components. But let me now switch to Heidegger, uh, which may seem like a strange transition, since Heidegger isn't usually viewed as a, a philosopher of substance. But oddly enough, he's the one who gave me these ideas uh, through his tool analysis, which is very famous, but which I think is, is widely misread. And admittedly, I don't think Heidegger would support this reading. I think Heidegger's reading is probably closer to the mainstream readings. Heidegger's own, Heidegger's own reading of this tool analysis would be closer to the readings that are more widespread of this tool analysis. But... The way I see it, a uh, philosophical book, I think, should be viewed just like an experiment in physics. You wouldn't take a physicist's word for it in interpreting their own experiment. You look at the data, and you come up with your own interpretation. This has happened time and again. Uh, Einstein did this with Michelson and Morley, and it's been done with other experiments. So I don't think we have to take Heidegger's own word for what the tool analysis means. Uh, some people in the room probably know it very well. Some probably maybe have never read it at all. Uh, but Heidegger's tool analysis, which is probably a good candidate for the most famous and most popular passage in all of 20th century philosophy, is the idea that things in the world are not primarily encountered by us through looking at them or through thinking about them, but through using them, or even better, through taking them for granted. So if you consider the number of entities that you are consciously aware of in the room right now and compare them to the number of entities that are actually at work here, it's a very small, thin film compared to the number of entities that are actually here at play, the floor. You're relying on the floor not to collapse. You're relying on the... Uh, it, it, if it collapsed, you would notice that. You're relying on the, the oxygen in the room to be at a breathable level. If you uh, saw James Lovelock the other night, as I did, and are as horrified by as I was, you were reliant on a certain climate uh, to allow certain kinds of behavior and a certain infrastructure and a certain agricultural network to function, to allow you to be here. Uh, you are reliant on your bodily organs. You are reliant on English grammar at the moment. Probably none of us, people in here probably all have pretty good command of the language. We're not having to think too hard the way we do when we're hearing a foreign language being spoken. So all these things are taken for granted. They tend to withdraw into the background. Consciousness is a fairly rare case for Heidegger. We tend to become conscious of things when they fail. Um, that's not the only time, but that, that's predominantly 
when we become conscious of things when they fail. Now, this has been widely talked about uh, by num thousands of scholars, I suppose. I have a slightly different reading of it for most people. Uh, the terminology he uses is uh, ready to hand or zu handenheit in German versus present at hand or for handenheit. Ready to hand being the tool that disappears while it's being used effectively and functioning effectively. Present at hand being what is visible, what is consciously accessible to us. And in some ways this can be viewed as his break with Husserl, who was his teacher, um, who in Heidegger's opinion, fairly or not, focused too much on, on consciousness, the sphere of consciousness, and not, on, not enough on the way, the pre-conscious way in which things are actually used. And so there's this reversal in Heidegger between tools and broken tools. When tools break, they become visible to us, they reverse from to Hananheit and to four Hananheit. Now, I, here's why I think this is misunderstood. This is often understood in a pragmatist way to say that Heidegger is saying there's an opposition between praxis and theory, that all theory emerges from this background of unnoticed praxis, that we have all these social practices that we're locked in, and then once in a while things emerge from that background. Uh, the reason I don't think that reading goes quite deep enough is that praxis doesn't exhaust the things any more than theory does. Um, if you want to say that theory distorts the reality of the thing and only gives a certain of its qualities, to give a theoretical model of something is always to oversimplify it, of course, but to practically use a thing is also to oversimplify it. So if I look at a hammer, I'm going to be reducing it to a certain number of familiar visible features. But if I use a hammer, the same thing is going to happen. There are going to be all sorts of properties in the hammer that might be accessible to mosquitoes or to you know, nails or to any other entities. There may be smells in it that a dog can smell. Dogs can smell anything that are not there for us. And so in a way, a praxis is just as liable to distort the reality of the things as theory is. And in fact, this is why tools can break. If, if our praxis used up everything that was there in the hammer, the hammer would never break. There wouldn't be anything in excess of our current use of it. The reason the hammer can surprise us is not just because it's deeper than what we notice of it, it's because it's deeper than our use of it. Um, and Heidegger also says that tools belong to a system. Tools cannot be viewed as individuals. They all belong to a system. But in fact, I think this is wrong. Tools belong to a system only insofar as they're working. Things are plugged together efficiently only because they're working. Uh, if, if a tool breaks somewhere, if a, if a machine part breaks somewhere, you see that it's not absorbed into the system. It's something more than that system. There's some materiality to it or some depth to it that the system never exhausts. And so it's not really true that things belong to a system, the tools belong to a system, as Heidegger says. Tools can break because they are not fully used up. And so in a way, this leads me to one first uh, somewhat counterintuitive point about Heidegger, which is that there really isn't that big a difference between tools and broken tools. Uh, both of them, even though there's supposed to be this radical difference because tools are being unconsciously used and broken tools erupt into consciousness because they're failing us, in a way, both of those are secondary compared to the tool itself, the tool and its tool being, as I call it. Because whether a tool breaks and you see it, okay, you're coming into relation to it then, and if the tool is working and you're not noticing it, it's still in relation to the other tools. It's still relational. It is still being harnessed into a set of relations. And the fact that the tool can break shows that it's not purely relational. There's some s substantiality to it. Um, and so that's why I think we have to go another step further beyond Heidegger's framework, which is basically Kantian, uh, it has to be said. The Kantian framework is that the only relation that's really at stake in philosophy is the relation between human and world. Are there things in themselves beyond us that we can never access because of our own human finitude? Or, in, as in some German idealists, is there nothing out there at all? And to think about a thing in itself is already to think it, and therefore there's nothing outside of our thinking. Either way, the relation that's at stake is the relation between human and world. What about the relation between parts of the world? What happens to this in philosophy, in contemporary economic philosophy? There's not much talk about this. What happens to the relation between fire and cotton, for example, which was a big medieval theme in Islamic philosophy? What happens when fire burns cotton? It seems to me that we're in the position now where we can only talk about how would that look to us, or how would we access that burning? Uh, very little is said about the, the burning itself, the relation of two inanimate things when humans aren't watching. This is sort of thrown to the sciences. It's no longer really a philosophical topic. It's assumed that philosophy is about what happens in the interaction between the human and the non-human. And um, that's why I think all the talk about embodiment and being in the world and we're, we're always already involved with things isn't quite enough, because what about the involvement of the things with each other? Why do humans always have to be one of the ingredients? This is why I love Mayasu's term correlationism, which he published for the first time three years ago. Correlationism is the idea that we can't have human without world or world without human, but there's always this primal relation, uh, correlation or rapport between the two. 
But why does a human always have to be involved? Why can't we talk about the relation between two inanimate things in the same way that we do of the relation between human and world? I can think of one... Could yes. Could you repeat that person's name? Miyasu. Miyasu. M-E-I-L-L-A-S-O-U-X. And he's well worth reading. His first book was published in 2006 in French. It was translated last year as After Finitude. It's available from Continuum pretty cheaply for a hardcover. And he's about to publish his big system, which is a remarkable piece of work. He is the leading student of Alain Badiou, and he's becoming quite well known uh, in the last year or so. Teaches at the École Normale Supérieure. And his, his system has some remarkable conclusions, such as that God does not exist but may exist in the future. That's probably the most amusing one. And he's got an argument for this. He thinks there are no laws of nature, everything is perfectly contingent. Anyway, the stuff is well worth reading. Very young guy. Um, at any rate, uh, the one major philosopher I can think of who makes this point is Whitehead. Whitehead says, the beginning of process in reality, let's simply go back before Kant. Let's treat all apprehensions or all relations on the same footing. Let's, let's not assume that the human world relation is paramount. Let's treat the relation between dirt and a window in the same way as we do between human and world. Obviously, the human relation is much more complicated and more interesting, maybe, than these inanimate ones. But Whitehead says, why start off assuming that they're different in kind? Why not treat all relations as being on the same footing first and then see what happens? And I would be in favor of this uh, step. So, uh, in terms of Heidegger... Instead of reading ready to hand as meaning practice and presence in hand as meaning theory, I end up reading them as meaning substance and relation. Ready to hand means the reality of things that is never reducible to any relation, whether to me when it breaks or whether to other tools when it's working. Uh, readiness to hand, contrary to what Heidegger wants, has to mean something that's deeper than all of those relations, whereas presence in hand means purely what is relational, which is in some ways the opposite of what he wants to say. He, wants to, he says in being in time that presence in hand is something independent, but it's actually not. Let me get to that in one second. Um, um, actually, I'll get to it now. Heidegger gives three different examples of types of presence at hand, and no one's ever really tried to unify them, why they all mean the same thing, but I think here's how you do it. Heidegger says that when we are theoretically aware of something, like we talk about a chemical in isolation from its context, okay, that's, that's a kind of presence at hand. We're, we're abstracting from the thing's context, we're making it present at hand in consciousness as an idea. Uh, when a tool breaks, it becomes present at hand in consciousness. And finally, he says physical substance is an example of presence at hand. And he says that's why we that's why presence at hand can't mean uh, must mean independence from us, but it doesn't because all three of these are clearly relational to us. If you think about it, if we make a theoretical model of something, of course we're the ones doing it, so it, it's not independent of us. We are the ones abstracting. If a tool breaks, it breaks for us. It's not the hammer itself that we see; it's the hammer distorted in some specific way. Certainly, certain qualities of the hammer are visible to us, so the hammers are again relational. And if I want to talk about physical matter, well, again, that's an abstraction. Um, who says that there's really this physical matter independent from us outside in the world? When we're talking about physical matter, we're usually talking about mass, and we're talking about velocity, and we're talking about spatial temporal location. But all of these are theoretical constructs uh, by humans, and so none of these things are really independent. What, what is the hammer and its independence, or what is physical reality and its independence? We don't really know. It's always mysterious. Any attempt to conceptualize it makes it relational with respect to us. It ruins the, independent, it ruins the autonomy of it and turns it into something less than an object. Okay, now this leads to the first strange sort of metaphysical problem that comes out of this. But I, as the years go by, I'm more and more attached to this. If it's true that objects hide from each other, according to this reading of Heidegger, as much as they hide from us, the question is how they can come into contact at all. If an object is never accessible to another object, why is there any interaction? Why don't we just have islands of different substances, that, different universes that never affect each other at all? That's, that runs contrary to experience. We see things affect each other. Uh, and this goes back to the traditional problem, now much laughed at, of occasionalism in philosophy, the metaphysics of occasionalism, uh, which is usually associated with the idea that God intervenes directly in every instance, is actually recreating everything every instant. Things are dissolving, or in a less extreme form, God is intervening and making all causal relations possible. This actually goes back to Islamic theology at a pretty early date in the Asharite school in Iraq, uh, they had a very uh, strict interpretation of the Quran in which uh, not only is God only the only creator, God is the only causal agent whatsoever. And so it would actually be blasphemy for the Asharite theologians to say that I picked up the pen. In fact, my doing this was merely the occasion for God to pick up the pen for me. And this led to all sorts of problems, such as obviously, how can I be sent to hell? If, you know, if I am the murderer, isn't it God who is actually doing the murdering for me? 
and these people were very strict and they said it's, it's simply by God's will whether you go to hell or not and you cannot complain if you're sent to hell for a murder that was actually committed by God. Uh, um, anyway, it started off in, in the Islamic tradition and this was combated by the more famous Islamic rationalists such as uh, first uh, Afarabi and Ibn Sina who have a, more of a Neoplatonist flavor to their philosophy and later Ibn Rushd Averroes Averroes who uh, has a more Aristotelian background to his philosophy uh, they were always fighting against the occasionalists in Islam. And it takes a while for this to appear in Europe. But other than a few early hints, it really takes until Descartes that you see anything like this, where there's a problem of the communication of the, of the uh, thinking substance with the physical substance, and so ultimately God is moving your, your body for you. This is many centuries after the Islamic version already, and it may seem like this is dead. Um, this is a, you know, it may seem like a historical relic to us, but in a sense, you can look at Hume and Kant as simply upside-down versions of occasionalism. So it's still with us in the sense that Hume and Kant are obviously very contemporary for us. They still are very much structuring our horizon now. Why do I say this? Well, first of all, there's the anecdotal point that Hume really was fond of Malebranche. Malebranche, the great French occasionalist, who said not only is God needed for the communication of mind and body, but for the communication of two bodies, just as the earlier Muslims said. Um, and what he and Hume obviously have in common is the idea that just because it looks like two things are affecting each other doesn't mean that they are. The difference, of course, is that Malebranche doesn't doubt that there are these independent substances that exist, and God is required to relate them. In Hume, it's just sort of an upside-down version, because what you have is you start with the relations. Things seem to already be related by customary conjunction. What's doubtful is whether they have an independent existence outside of that conjunction, independent power outside of that conjunction. And so in a way, we are, we are still very much with this occasionalist philosophy of gaps. It's just a different gap. It's the gap between human and world rather than the gap between independent substances. Um, and I would argue that we have not really escaped this. Okay. I already see that I need to speed up a little bit. Uh, I've already said something about this next page. The real problem for me with Heidegger is that we are stuck, I would say, in this correlation between human and world, between Sein and Dasein. Uh, and it's true that Heidegger talks about being in the world, and so there's not this subject-object difference where the world is outside of us, and we're over here, but we're always somehow intertwined with it. But the question is, why does everything always have to be intertwined with a human? What about the intertwining of two things in the absence of humans? Uh, why, has, why does Heidegger have nothing to say about inanimate relations? I can't even think of any passages where he talks about them in, in his entire philosophy. This is left to the sciences. And last night I was reading Peter Paul Fabek's uh, What Things Do, since you said people here are interested in that. And here's a place also where he and I would differ, because he very much says that we can't go back to the subject-object dichotomy, by which he means we can't think that they're separate from each other. We have to look at the things as constituting each other. And I would say, why is there still always a human in the picture for Fabek? Why not, why not be able to talk about inanimate physical relations in the same way that you talk about ones in which humans are involved? And this brings me to Latour, who uh, I first started reading through a chance suggestion of a friend 11 years ago, and the impact was pretty immediate. I was a kind of disaffected Heidegger, slowly becoming disaffected Heideggerian, coming out of a decade of Heidegger at that point. And Latour is a good remedy both for Heidegger's tone, which can be very gloomy compared to Latour's witty, very inventive tone, and also in terms of Latour's respect for individual objects, which tend to be denigrated in Heidegger. Latour has funny passages mocking, mocking Heidegger where he says, for example, that the gods are present even in Adidas shoes and in the calculations of shopkeepers. And these are very funny if you're coming from Heidegger, uh, where, where the tone is, is very romantic and very ominous at all times. And so uh, Latour was a nice uh, contrast to that. And most importantly, inanimate actors really get to do something in Latour. Inanimate actors, in principle at least, are treated the same way as humans for Latour. They're all actants. Critics of Latour, for, for understandable reasons, think that he is still stuck in a human world correlation, and I can think of a couple of passages that give them this impression. One of them is the one where Latour says that uh, um, microbes did not really exist before Pasteur discovered them. Right? That um, after Latour, I mean, I'm sorry, after Pasteur, they existed before Pasteur. It's the kind of thing Merleau Ponty would also say. Right? That, that, uh, you can't say that things naively pre-exist their discovery. Another example is when he, even more controversial, he was attacked for this by Sokol and people, and was saying that it's an, it's an anachronism to say that Ramses II died of tuberculosis because tuberculosis hadn't been discovered yet. So this sounds like a very anti-realist statement by Latour. So it's understandable why he was attacked by scientific realists. 
I would argue, however, that this is just a bridge too far rhetorically for Latour and that this isn't really central to his theory. If you go back and look at the early Latour especially, he says that things interpret each other just as we interpret them. There are plenty of passages like that in Irreductions, which I think is his best philosophical work. That's the appendix to the pasteurization of France, the last 80 or 90 pages. And uh, when I started writing this book on Latour, which will come out next month finally, uh, I had it structured completely differently, and I, I talked to him, and he said, no, you should start the book with irreductions because he thinks that's the root of all of his philosophy. So it has the stamp of approval from Latour himself, who thinks that that book was unjustly ignored, and having studied a lot now, I think he's right. I think that is his most significant philosophical work uh, from 1984, when he was in his late 30s. Pretty early work. Okay, Latour's main concepts. These will be in the book, but let me summarize them for you. I, I argue that there are four main metaphysical concepts in Latour in my book, uh, actance, irreduction, translation, and alliance. Actance, of course, means that all actants are on the same footing, whether real or unreal, imaginary, human or inhuman. You can't talk about trees or hammers or electrons in a different way from how you talk about Popeye or unicorns. They're all actants. Irreduction meaning that, uh, in a way, th it means that things are cut off from each other. That You cannot say that things are either reducible or irreducible to anything else. You cannot really reduce dreams to wish fulfillments without doing a certain number of translations to get you from one point to the other. And there's always going to be a, an energy loss when you do that. There's always going to be some misunderstanding and some sacrifice. But on the other hand, you can also do that. You can show an equivalence of things as long as you do the work. But it, it takes energy. It's not automatic. And translation, which I've already hinted at, which is that when you move a thing from one point to another, there's a distortion involved. You cannot say, Latour is an anti-substance philosopher all the way. You cannot say that there's a, something that endures the same in different contexts. You have to show that there's an equivalence. When you move a thing from one point in space-time to another, when you change its relations to other things, you have to show that they're the same. And he thinks this is how the sciences work. The sciences work by showing that these readings on an instrument need a series of translations to prove that they mean something that's unseen. Uh, uh, that's a major point in the tour. And alliance, this is the one I really disagree with. This is the idea that a thing is nothing more than its alliances with other things. That there, a thing does not have any independent reality, and that things are not more real or less real than others, they're simply more or less strong than others. And so if Santa Claus is less convincing than quarks, it's simply because there are stronger allies testifying to the existence of quarks than Santa Claus. Santa Claus, you've just got a few children and fairy tales and a few films and popular books, whereas quarks, you have these massive, gigantic scientific apparatuses that are testifying to their existence indirectly, high-level physical theorists testifying to their existence, and so on. But uh, you start off putting all of these things on the same level, whether they're myth or reality or physical or mental or artificial, and it's the number of allies and the strength of the allies that makes some stronger than others. And that's the one I really reject, because that implies that things are only real through their effects on other things. Now, I would agree, of course, with the actin concept, because I like the idea that all things are, are put on the same footing and that you're able to, tr to treat things equally, at least at the start, without making preliminary decisions that atoms are real and sociological structures are artificial, which is what reductionists still like to do. Um, and I also agree with the, the model of irreduction, which is that things in a way are self-contained. And here's the irony about Latour. On the one hand, Latour is the great philosopher of relations. A thing is nothing different from how it affects other things. But on the other hand, a thing is totally isolated in its current set of relations. Since a thing is so defined by its relations, it can't automatically easily move into a new set of relations. If I'm totally defined by wearing this jacket and sitting here and having this notebook open to this page, how do I then move to the next page? How do I change the supposedly accidental features? Because there are no accidental features for Latour. A thing is totally defined by all of its features, no matter how trivial they seem to be. And the only way this could happen for Latour is through translation or through mediation. Any change of a thing from one state to another or any link between two things requires a mediator, requires a third thing to serve as a mediator. And the great example he used in Pandora's Hope is that there was a time when politics and neutrons had nothing to do with each other, before the nuclear age. Who linked politics with neutrons? Well, in France, it was Frédéric Joliot Curie. He was the one who had to establish that neutrons might be of interest to the French government with the Nazi threat looming, that France might want to pursue an atomic bomb project. So Joliot was the mediator between uh, neutrons and politics. And that's a nice analysis. The problem is, what links Joliot to each of these? This is something Latour never answers. If neutrons can't touch politics, why can Joliot touch neutrons and why can Joliot touch politics? It seems like there will be an infinite number of mediators. You would have to say that Joliot's instruments are the mediator between him and neutrons. What's the instrument between him and the mediators? Is it the factory that makes the mediators? Now, you, you could end this problem just by saying, for all practical purposes, we don't need to get into all the details of what all the mediators are, and just for 
purposes of uh, actor network theory, we can focus on the important ones. But if you're doing metaphysics, as Latour wants to do and claims to do, you need to be very exact about this and figure out how can there be an infinite chain of mediators? How can anything ever touch? You still have the occasionalist problem then. If there's never any immediate contact between two things, what allows things to interact at all? That's something he never answers. This is one of my major criticisms in the book. Um, but we can say that Latour earns the honor of being what I would call the first secular occasionalist because he has this occasionalist problem of how do you link things. In the past, that was always a theological problem. God is always coming in to do it. Even in Whitehead, it's God that does it. It's God who contains the eternal objects, which are roughly equivalent to platonic forms. This is where they're contained, and the things meet through the mediation of gods. Latour simply drops that. For Latour, it's local actors that mediate. And that's a really new achievement in philosophy, I would say, that he, he has the relation problem in a very s severe form, but then also has a secular solution to it, even, even though it doesn't quite work because there's these, these infinite mediators. It is, it are, it, it's local mediators who do the work. It's not God's. And I think that's a first. So he deserves credit for that. And I think the real problem for him is that he only has one kind of object. This is both his virtue and his vice. Everything is an actant. And since everything is an actant, everything should have the same problem relating to every other kind of actant. And so that you're never going to find a mediator capable of bridging any two of them unless you just sort of cut it off pragmatically and say... For all practical purposes, Joliot can touch neutrons. Okay, then for all practical purposes, why can't neutrons touch politics without Joliot helping? There is a real metaphysical problem there that Latour does not address. Uh, Latour has Hamlet and Popeye and black swans and white ravens and unicorns all in the same space-time as Xerxes, Barack Obama, James Lovelock, all of these. He gives all these funny examples in his book. All of these things are equally real, even if they're not equally strong. And though I like this democracy of actors, uh, I wonder how all two of them can touch... Any, any two of them can touch if they're all the same type. And this is why I think Latour needs a philosopher who is, he's not very fond of, and that is Edmund Husserl, who I will talk about here a bit, who talks about intentional objects. And uh, I think there has to be a distinction between intentional objects and real ones that I'll get into in a, in a minute. But uh, Latour does not have any distinction whatsoever. Everything's an act. Everything is imminent in the world of relations. There's no difference between objects that are real around, for us and objects that are real in a physical sense at all. Um, for Husserl, intentionality means that consciousness is supposedly already reaching out beyond itself. And as much as I love Husserl, I'm enough of a realist that this doesn't quite satisfy me, because this is still the intertwining of the human and the world. I don't think that gets us far enough to account for the interaction between non-human things. And so I think we need a slightly different concept. And I think Heidegger's tool analysis is right to criticize this phenomenological concept of intentionality. But it seems to me that within the realm of appearance, Husserl does something that, in its mature form, may be unprecedented. I know some of the other Austrians were doing certain things with object philosophy. But uh, other philosophers had talked about a split between object and content. But this was generally a split between an object outside of us and a content in our minds, that somehow there was this duality. What Husserl does that's, that's very interesting is makes the split within the phenomenal realm, so that you have... For example, uh, you're circling a tree. These, these, these famous moments in phenomenology. You're circling a tree. The tree is a unified object, even though the exact profile, the exact adumbrations of the tree are changing constantly. As you circle it, your mood is changing a bit in every instance. The angle and distance you have to the tree, the amount of sunlight is changing in every instance. So the tree is not a bundle of qualities for Husserl, um, uh, unlike for empiricism. It's, it's, it, it's an object over and above, or perhaps over and, over and beneath those qualities. Uh, uh, so Husserl is a fan of objects. I would call him an idealist, but it's still an object-oriented idealism, which I think is a remarkable, remarkable thing. Um, here's a difference between these objects and Heidegger's tools. The hammer in Heidegger withdraws. It's deeper than any access we have to it. It's deeper than any theoretical or practical access we have to it. I would say the comparisons are sometimes made, the hammer in Husserl, the intentional object hammer, does not withdraw. It's there. It's there for us. The problem is the opposite. The problem is that it's too much there. It's too encrusted with extraneous details that we have to get rid of when we are giving an eidetic analysis of the hammer. We have to get rid of, of many of the things that are not essential to the hammer. So it's almost the opposite problem. It's there for us at all times in a way that Heidegger's hammer is not. It is encrusted with superfluous qualities. It's not bundled together from them. The intentional hammer does not hide. 
it is there, it is too present, it is, it is there for us in too detailed a form. And Husserl even says that the, uh, to have a, an essential intuition of the hammer, no sensual fulfillment is enough. That's not what's going to give you the edos of the hammer. That's not going to be an essential, an essential kind of fulfillment. And I think this would be useful for the tour because here we have a kind of contact with objects that is not mediated, but that is mediate. I do have a, I as a real object do have a, an immediate contact with the intentional objects. The, the hammers, the pens, the pieces of paper are there for me. Even if the real versions of those things are forever withdrawn and distorted by my perception of them, I don't think the intentional objects are distorted. They simply have too much detail, but they are there for me. They are there for me in my experience. And so this must be somehow where the immediate contact is occurring. Somehow the uh, real objects which can never come into immediate contact with each other must be translated in into the form of intentional objects, and that's where the, the immediate contact occurs. And I would go so far as to say that this happens well beyond the human realm. I know panpsychism is still a dirty word in many circles, but it's becoming slowly more respectable again. There are a few even, uh, since David Chalmers and uh, Galen Strawson got on board a bit, it's not, it's not so crazy sounding to be a panpsychist anymore. It would seem to me that perhaps inanimate objects encounter intentional versions of each other uh, in their collisions, and that it's not simply a blind mechanical impact. The one way in which I, I would say I'm not a panpsychist is that panpsychists tend to think that things are conscious or, or are psychic merely by dint of existing. I would not go that far because I think things can exist without being in relation. Uh, we get a taste of this in sleep. I mean, obviously, we're not totally out of relation with things when we sleep, but we're withdrawing from relations to some extent, and yet we're still real when we sleep. So in a way, could it be the case that objects sleep, in a sense, when they're out of relation? There could be objects that exist that are simply never tapped by other objects, or at least temporarily never coming into relation with other objects, uh, but could still be real. They could still be real because they still have real parts, they still have real qualities, but simply don't affect anything beyond themselves. Contra Latour, who thinks that a thing cannot be real if it's not affecting anything else. I find it completely plausible to think that there are objects... Uh, that could exist without affecting anything else. And I came up with some examples, none of which are immediately totally convincing to everyone, but things like the McCain-Victory Coalition. Would you really want to say that the McCain-Victory Coalition would only have existed if he had won? No, I think there probably was a real coalition there that he could have tapped, that he failed to tap. Um, that might not be the best example, but there might be others. That, uh, of something that can be real without ever having been discovered or ever com having come into relation with anything else. And in passing... Wait... Let me make sure I didn't miss anything on that page. Okay, oh, actually, I wanted to say this. So at the level of intentional objects, I would say there are two differences at work. There's a difference between an intentional object and its accidents. So you have a, the accidental data that you're seeing of a tree or of a building or of anything else that can be chained, very varied within certain limits without affecting the underlying object. There's that difference. But there's also the difference between the thing and its essential qualities, because you couldn't just piece the thing together by taking some essential qualities and bundling them together either. So there's, the thing is, the, an intentional object is existing according to two polarizations. It's different from its accidents. It's also different from its own essential qualities. And in passing, I wanted to say that I'm a fan of essence. Essence gets dumped on as much as substance does, but I think it's very important. I think as soon as you're a realist of any sort, you have to say that a real thing has some inherent reality that is not affected by what perceives it or what bumps into it or what's, what relations it comes into, and therefore you have a kind of essence. I think the, the problem that happens is sometimes there's a confusion between um, a thing's essential reality and a thing's essential meaning. So, for example, in Derrida's essay, White Mythology, he gets all upset because Aristotle thinks things have a reality outside of how they're expressed. Uh, and Derrida slides from that to thinking that Aristotle says there's an, one meaning to every word, one essential meaning to every word that's different from the inessential meanings. And that's not really what Aristotle says. Aristotle just thinks things are what they are. They're not everything. The same person is not a plant, is not a boat. The same thing is not a trireme, a wall, and a man, as he says. Um, Aristotle is obviously a great fan of the poets. He's not saying that each word has to have one literal meaning, as I read it. I think Derrida is unfair there. Anyway, as soon as we can see that something has some sort of autonomous reality, then I think we have to say that it has an essence. And I think essence should, should be brought back into general use. Okay, now just as the intentional object differs from its qualities, I think there are also real objects, these tools that Heidegger talks about, which are always going to be inaccessible to any kind of relation to them. But those also have to differ from their qualities. You can see this, for example, in Leibniz, who says that a monad is one thing, but it can't just be one thing because then all monads will be alike. It has to have a plural, plurality of qualities. And for, Monad, for, for Leibniz, these are all relations, which for me, they're not. 
But there's another philosophy by the name of Javier Zubiri, who was a student of Heidegger and Ortega y Gasset, who did his best work in the 1960s. He's a Spanish Basque ontologist, very powerful, uh, who makes the same point, that a, a real thing, a, the essence of a thing is a system of notes, a system of qualities, and, but it's not bundled together from those qualities. It unifies them in a specific way. And so a thing is a unity, but it's also a unity of many specific qualities. So this does lead to a kind of two-storied model of the universe, even if there's this infinite layer of black boxes so that UCD can be an actor and the buildings in UCD can be an actor and the parts of the buildings can be actors and the people can be actors and the bodily organs of people can be actors. Even so, there is still a kind of dualism between real things that withdraw from relations and are also different from their own qualities and things that exist only intentionally, only as appearing in relation for something else which also differ from their qualities. And this provides a solution to the great puzzle of Heidegger's studies, which was Heidegger's fourfold, the Gefiert, which w w received less intelligible explanation in Heidegger's studies than perhaps any other key concept. Uh, this concept really gets going in 1949, in Heidegger's first appearance after the war, this famous Bremen lecture, Ein Blicken das was ist. And this is a fourfold of earth, sky, gods, and mortals, which sounded to many people like Heidegger was just sinking into poetic post holderlinian gibberish was becoming less rigorous all the time. But if you look at it, uh, fourfold structures are extremely common in the history of philosophy. You can find them all over the place. Uh, they're not all the same, but they do all result from two dualisms crossing, it seems, if you go and look at all of them. The question is simply choosing the correct dualism, because if you say that all entities are either human or non-human, and all entities are either left-handed or right-handed, uh, you could also create a very ridiculous fourfold. It's, it's a fourfold structure, but it's one that's of no relevance ontologically. So you have to make sure that the, the two dualisms you choose are appropriate. And I would say that the one I've just outlined is very similar to Heidegger's fourfold, simply, but not the famous one from 1949, but an earlier one from 1919, when he's talking about Husserl, when he says that there's a difference between things as, as phenomenally present to us and things in their performance or execution. He calls it Fulzuk. And in both levels, there's a difference between the thing being something specific and the thing being something at all. So it's kind of like an existence-essence distinction, both in the real thing and the things that appears to us. That's pretty similar to the one I just talked about. What happens in 1949 is he changes it so that it's a difference between the world and a whole and a specific thing. So the Earth is a gigantic Earth that encompasses all things and is hidden. It's not broken into parts. Whereas, as I read it, uh, God's is the hidden part that's broken up into specific things. And on the other level, you've got mortals, which I read as being the world as a whole, as unified, as revealed in the experience of angst, or being towards death, where the world as a whole becomes distant from us and we're no longer concerned with specific entities, and sky, which I read as the world is broken up into specific entities. But that's that would take more time to, to prove that reading. Uh, anyway, um, I think these four... What's more interesting than the four quadrants of Heidegger's fourfold are the four polarities, the, the diagonal lines between them. What are these tensions between each of the four poles of the fourfold? And I can end on this, actually, because I've already used almost enough time. These polarizations have more common names. For example, what is the difference between real objects and the qualities that they present to us? I would call this space, because what is space? You know, there's this famous debate between Leibniz and Clark is space an objective container, space and time objective containers, empty containers for events the way Newton and Clark say, or is it just simply the system of relations as Leibniz says? I say that it's neither of those. It's the system of relations and non-relations. Space isn't just relational, because if space were just relational, everything would fuse together. We'd all relate and be exhausted by relations. But that's not what space is. Space is also distance. And so space is also the distance of things from each other, just as much as it is the interface between them. And so I would read this polarity between real objects and their, the qualities that they manifest to us as space. Likewise, I would say that the difference between intentional objects and the swirling accidents that they manifest on their surface is time. That is what our experience of time is. We see things change. Things stay somewhat stable for a while, and yet we see them from slightly shifting angles or distances or different levels of light or moods. This is how we feel time passing. We feel time passing by... Uh, things staying somewhat stable and yet altering slightly on their, uh, in their service features. So this would be time. And, you know, if you're going to be in philosophy, you always got to have one problem where you say, ah, oh, I've been worried about this problem ever since the earliest childhood. This is what I've always cared about. And luckily I do have this in my own case, because ever since I was a child, I did wonder, why do people always talk about space and time? 
and they might talk about how many different dimensions of space there could be that are hidden, but why is it always space and time that are put together as though there's no other continuum that's there equal? Why not space, time, and a few other things? Maybe we're just not thinking clearly enough, and there are other things that belong on that same level. And I think here, this model allows us to see that there are two other things, uh, because this model has four tensions, which are the, distance, the difference between the, a real object and its real qualities and the qualities that manifest to us, and also the difference between an intentional object and the accidental qualities that manifest, but also the essential qualities that it has. Uh, there, that's four polarities. Uh, so where are the other two? If, if two of them are time and space, well, uh, as I see it, the difference between the real object and its qualities, as Zubiri calls it, is its essence. The essence is the tension between the thing as a unified system and its different features that characterize it as what it is. It is. And also you have this, this, this difference that Husserl talks about between the unified intentional object and its numerous essential moments, which is the eidos in Husserl's sense, not Plato's. And so if this schema is right, you have this very interesting metaphysical model where time and space are just two special cases of tension or polarization between objects and their qualities. Objects and their qualities is the fundamental tension. Time and space are merely two manifestations of that tension. So instead of a philosophy of time and space, we need a philosophy of time, space, essence, and eidos, or the four different kinds of polarization between objects and their qualities, which radical philosophies would deny because radical philosophies try to deny that there's an object in the first place. An object is just its relations or just its bundle of qualities or, or whatever. So by by uh, granting objects their dignity, we end up with this strange set of four polarities. But I want to end on this note. A, pol a polarization is just a tension. You can say that an object is in tension with its qualities, but there's no reason that tension can't persist forever. You can have tension between two countries and they never fight. You can have tension between two people and they never quarrel. Uh, what is it that makes something happen? You have to have more than a tension. You have to have a split. You have to split a thing from its qualities so that the qualities are able to act on other things outside of that bond that they have with their normal objects. And as luck would have it, this is not unknown in the history of philosophy. It is known especially to late scholasticism. You go and read the works of Francisco Suarez, the parts where he talks about causation, and he says something very interesting about this. He says substantial forms or substances or objects can't touch. They're so specific, uh, you can't really move them from one place to another. And so they influence each other by way of accidents. That's the only way they can have causal influence on each other. And this happens in both natural and supernatural ways for him. Uh, for example, it happens in natural ways because heat, uh, for instance, the natural place of heat would be fire, but heat can go into metal, it can go into water, and be borrowed by them for a time. And this is what, ca this is what efficient causation is for Suarez. It's the qualities moving elsewhere, a place they don't belong, and causing something to happen. Uh, one example he talks about over and over again that's hilarious for us because we don't believe this anymore is that they be apparently believed in the time that metal was created underground by heat from the sun coming and going underground and, and creating the metals there. That's another example. The supernatural examples, one would be the Eucharist, where the um, um, accidents of the wine would become detached from the substance of the wine and would be used directly by gods. Another one would be the case of semen, which he says becomes it's a, kind of accidental features becoming detached from the Father and being utilized directly by God to miraculously create a new soul. Um, anyway, he was on to this, this idea that the, the accidents have to become separated from the things in order to go and, and influence something else. And so this rather strange sort of ontology that I'm drawing out of Heidegger and Latour and the Husserl actually has a pretty classical background to it. You can go back and find parallels for it. And that's, that's not a bad thing, I think, because I think the substantial forms need to be brought back. They're too little respected in contemporary philosophy. Another example, I think, and I wrote about this in Gorilla Metaphysics, which I think you have there. I think I saw the clown on the cover. Is uh, metaphor. Uh, I use both Ortega's theory of metaphor and Max Black's theory of metaphor. And what happens there, according to both of those theories, is that the qualities of one object become detached and become attached to another in a way that is, is difficult for us to assimilate. And so if this is true, then aesthetics would take its place along. To, if you look at metaphor as the root of aesthetics, which it might, may or may not be, depending on, on how you read aesthetics, uh, metaphor would belong on the same level as physical causation in metaphysics, which would be interesting because aesthetics is usually sort of the ignored stepsister of philosophy. It's sort of a fun side activity. It's not usually considered as central to philosophy, aesthetics, but it really could be. It could be central to, to how the world works. If uh, the causal structure and the metaphorical structure both work in a similar fashion, in a way, you could say that theoretical comportment does this because it's trying to separate away the thing from its, the various properties that manifests and abstracts and say what the thing really is by itself. You could say that perception does this because we're not totally fooled in perception. I, I don't I'm not really fooled by all the shadow and all the surface effects of the thing. I look past those. 
I think Merleau Ponty points out that our heads are never completely vertical, and yet I don't think you're all tilted sideways, even though I actually see you that way. I read I read through that data and see you as, as vertical. Uh, and so anyway, there could be this entire series of ways that things become detached from their own qualities. And there's probably a way to systematize these, but this is a topic for another time because I've already gone about 50 minutes. So I'll leave it there and open myself up to questions. I hope that wasn't too much metaphysics for the non-philosophers. No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Yes. You're, you're starting to be my own to fit a lot of substance in 50 minutes. I try to, yeah. <laughs> try to make it. Uh, so thanks very much. It was really a kind of a great, great big tour of, of Western, not only Western, but Eastern and all sorts of other philosophies as well. So um, Dermot has very generously, and I think bravely, given that uh, there was no paper to, to, to read beforehand, <laughs> agreed to, um, uh, to respond. Um, I'm, so so I'm sorry about that. I would have prepared a paper. I was told not to. No problem. I have to fight. Okay. Um, so I, you would use the word you said informal. So hopefully this is a relatively informal reply because okay. um, I hadn't heard it before, but I very much enjoyed listening to it. And uh, indeed, uh, I learned a lot because I wasn't very—I'm not very familiar with recent uh, French philosophy. Some of the people you mentioned, mm -hmm. sending from Latour and so on. Uh, since I work more with. Uh, what's now probably called classical phenomenology of right. Sir Heidegger, but there's enough intersection that I can see where some of this is coming from and, 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 and some comments to make on it. Um, uh, the, re the, the reconstitution of the thing, if you like, or, or, or restoring dignity to the thing uh, is uh, something that you put at the center of what you've been talking about. And you talked in various ways at the beginning about how different philosophies have, in one way or another, tried to uh, get rid of things, you know, translate them into relations, or mm -hmm. uh, deny the existence of substances underlying accidents, or you know, say that things are not different from their parts, and so on. And, and I agree with all of that. I think that, uh, and, and, uh, and I think you correctly point out, that Heidegger himself makes uh, thinks that thinking about things is very important, and he thinks the concept of the thing is one uh, that needs a lot of reflection. And uh, there you drew on, uh, or you started from the Heidegger's own distinction uh, in being in time between two ways of experiencing things, things understood as tools um, and things understood as, you might say, objects, things that are just simply over and against you right. that you either contemplate or see or think about but are not uh, engaged with in a sort of manipulative uh, tool-like manner. And as you said, that, has, that is a very, very deep and controversial uh, discussion that has had an enormous impact. And I'm not sure uh, exactly about your reading. I did like one point you made in it, as you said yourself, that your reading it doesn't necessarily agree with the classical uh, um, interpretation, and indeed you said Heidegger leans more to the classical interpretation than to your reading. But I think you made a point that I think is absolutely uh, vital here. Um, which is that, uh, as you said, praxis or practical engagement with things is as liable to distort reality as theoretical right. looking. And I think that's very, very important. And um, I'd like to say a little bit about that. Um, but Heidegger thought of himself largely as overcoming Husserl, uh, whom he thought was overly theoretical in his approach to things. But there, there was a reason for that in Husserl. I mean, what Husserl was largely trying to explain was the success of Western science, especially post-Galilean science, um, and what he regarded as the, uh, the the purely scientific, the detached spectator viewpoint of the scientist, which allowed us to stand back from reality and, and, and look at the world in general. And Husserl was, especially in his later work, trying to explain how that attitude arose. He thought about, first of all, it only arose in the West, that, that there weren't, and other forms of culture, Chinese, Indian, uh, and so on, had not developed this scientific technological outlook, precisely because they had never developed this standpoint of the detached spectator. So, theoria in the Greek sense, the Greek sense of, of theory or, or, or uh, um, <laughs> a detached uh, understanding. Uh, largely pursued, of course, in Galileo onwards through mathematics. You know, Galileo's thing, the book of nature is written in mathematics. So it's mathematics, which in itself is a very abstract uh, set of uh, concepts. And that somehow uh, miraculously unlocks the way things really are. 
but only through the, the tax per, uh, of the spectator. So this is Husserl's point. And Husserl thinks this has an enormous power, but Husserl also does think that there's a certain amount of uh, distortion involved because it takes us away from what he says is our engagement, our original experience in the life world. For Husserl does think that we largely encounter things uh, uh, as food, as, as uh, um, uh, items to be leaned on, or you know, uh, uh, ground to be stood on, and, and so on. We, we, are, we are always encountering things as some use objects in one way or another. And it's precisely those uses that were stripped aside in order to be able to get the contemplative point of view. Because, uh, I mean, this wasn't so much discussed by, 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 by Husserl, but certainly afterwards by um, quite a number of thinkers who tried to explain the, the success of Western sciences in the 17th century onwards, that the very first thing that the Western sciences had to do was quite obviously to separate very clearly between two sets of properties of a thing. Those ones that were relative to us, like how they appear to us, their color, uh, their, uh, their attractiveness or whatever, and those things that the object had in itself, the so-called, this was the block and so on, became the distinction between what was called primary and secondary qualities. Um, and science was supposed to study only the primary qualities, the weight of a thing, its motion, its, uh, uh, its properties that it has in itself, whereas those that are, as Husserl calls it, subjective relative properties like uh, color are regarded as not really present in the thing at all. And it's because science was able to do that that it was able to progress. It was able to distinguish these two sets of properties, which in pre-modern uh, philosophy had not been distinguished. I mean, this is a line that, that Husserl takes. So uh, someone like Thomas Kuhn points out that one of the reasons that early chemistry develops uh, in, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it develops away from alchemy, because it was able to distinguish that uh, Besides gold being uh, heavy and uh, malleable, and these other characters, it, it, alchemists also thought it was, you know, glistening and uh, uh, joyful. And and there was no way of there was no way in which science could handle the glistening and joyful character. So they concentrated on mass and on uh, uh, various other chemical properties that uh, could be identified. Similarly, you know, lead was said to be be not just heavy, but, but uh, ponderous. Uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn quotes a, a description of lead from an alchemist thing that talks about lead being sullen and ponderous. Mm. And you see, you can see why you're not going to get Western science in the modern sense if you're focusing more on the sullen, ponderous quality of the lead, you're not going to, which is relative to us. So, so, precise, so what Husserl is interested in is precisely what you need to do, what science had to do, was distinguish those subjective relative properties from the so-called primary objective ones. Uh, now, there's a whole history of modern philosophy which showed how that distinction became problematic, for me and others. But at least what it does do is that in Husserl, it means that it's not that Husserl himself is, is prioritizing uh, one set of properties or another, but he's trying to explain how it happened that science has progressed so strongly from a particular theoretical angle. Heidegger wants to turn that around by placing more emphasis on the pragmatic outlook and the practical engagement with things as tools, where uh, largely we, th their qualities don't stand out for us um, while, we're, while they're successfully being used. It's only, as you said, when they break down that they suddenly uh, stand forth as having a certain uh, mm. obstinacy or that they stand forth as having a certain kind of uh, uh, can't get around them, as it were. And it's because of that that you have to face up to them. And then you start looking from the theoretical standpoint. So for, for Heidegger, it's not that he got rid of this tech, the, the theoretical standpoint, but it's, he made it secondary to the pragmatic engagement. And, and, and I actually think that uh, what happens in Heidegger is that Heidegger himself regarded the, that twofold approach to things, two-hand and four-hand, and the, the, uh, the, the, the ready-to-hand and the present-to-hand way of approaching things in, uh, was too narrow. And indeed, that's what happens in the 1930s, and especially when he's writing about artwork. Because he thinks that artworks are examples of entities that don't fall neatly out to either being tools or just things to be encountered, but seem to have a, some sort of third character uh, so that they're not entirely eaten up, if you like, by their being used. Uh, nor are they uh, just simply there like any other uh, things in the natural world. And so he starts to become more, uh, I think, uh, 
differentiated in its conception of the different kinds of things there are. And, and, and that <coughs> led me to, to think something about that, uh, about what you were saying towards the end of your paper, um, and indeed in criticizing <coughs> um, some thinkers who have been a little too reductionist in their approach to different kinds of entities. Um, you know, and, I, and again, I'm not, I think, I'm sympathet I think you're sympathetic to people like Aristotle, who famously said being is said in many ways, and there are different kinds of entities, and we just must start from the plurality of uh, different kinds of things. So you met yourself mentioned uh, all kinds of objects, uh, not just natural entities, but social objects of various kinds, institutions, uh, 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 abstract entities, uh, intentional entities, fictional entities, and so on. So, so you know, one of the very first things in doing a metaphysics um, is is just to kind of make a catalog of everything that's out there. I mean, some Brentano, who was Husserl's uh, teacher, said that. Uh, he, he, he claimed, and he was trying to do psychology, that you know, he said, just like, you know, you, just, you don't start off doing zoology by imagining what kinds of entities there could be. You actually go out and look and discover there are you know, family forces in Australia. And then you have to explain how they fit into your categories. But you start with the different kinds of entities. So, so even in psychology, uh, um, Brentano thought we had to first categorize all the different kinds of consciousness, for example, there were. You know, there's dream consciousness, and there's imagination, and there's memory, and there's perception, and there's uh, hoping and fearing. And, you know, so you just have to first of all make a list. And it's the same thing with metaphysics. And I think you know, various lists have been made, and, and uh, we keep adding to them. And indeed, uh, um, you, you did a very good job in, 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 in talking about various ones. I worry about Latour's concept of actants, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that, that seems to be part of this thing of reducing back everything to a single kind of entity. Uh, um, so that it doesn't matter what kind of thing it is as long as it just plays some role in a system or it, 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 it engages in some way with other things. Or it has no, it has no reality apart from this engagement with other things. So I think that once you start uh, having a single category of entity, uh, um, you're already going down that reductionist road uh, which uh, Latour itself is trying to get away from, and which you think are trying to get away from. So, so I, I would think that um, uh, I would, you know, strongly agree with your, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, plur pluralist view of entityhood. <coughs> that there are many different kinds of entities and many different kinds of things. I do think that a danger in post phenomenology of the French kind, whether it be structuralism or post structuralism. Um, or the current uh, approaches, postmodern approaches to philosophy, tend to have uh, become too objectivist in that they are ignoring the subject. And that, you know, and that a subject is another kind of entity. And this is one of the things that I felt uh, is missing, especially you know, uh, uh, in uh, structuralism, which I uh, wanted to argue uh, that uh, you know, if you read Foucault, this famous kind of stuff, that uh, the death of man and so on, that that. Uh, what mattered was the play of forces or the, you know, the power structures in history or something like that, and, and that individual subjects weren't really actors in history in the right way in which uh, someone like Sartre or the phenomenologist would have said that they were. And I think that I want to say a little bit on behalf of subjectivity as an essential kind of entity, very different from the, from the other one, but which also needs its own description. And that, that, that's what I think is missing in people like that for at least as far as I'm And that leads me to to the concept that you did uh, have of, uh, which I'm very much interested in, uh, of correlationism uh, as a way of characterizing, if you like, all post-Kantian philosophy, which claims that uh, since Kant, uh, there has been this emphasis that philosophy is really about the man-world relation or that the subject-object correlation in some sense, uh, so that you can only talk about this sort of mutual world as understood by humans rather than somehow as there being a world of a thing about the thing itself. And I think that concept of correlation is very helpful because I think it does unite together a great deal of modern philosophy, whether it be someone like uh, uh, Hegel or Husserl. Uh, Husserl indeed even speaks about his philosophy as a kind of a priori correlation yeah. between objectivity. So. Or on the other hand, people like Wittgenstein and Davidson, on the other hand, who want to have everything as a sort of uh, set of relations to human practices and, and linguistic practices in particular. So the things that don't, aren't visible except through human practices. Um, so I, I think that's a fantastic kind of 
category for approaching a whole set of modern philosophies. What you want to do with that, though, is what next comes in. And uh, you tend to sort of slip back, as I think, into kind of pre-modern, let's get back to the things prior to the correlations, or let's describe things independent of their correlations to the human. You talk about thing-thing relations, for example. Mm -hmm. But you know, I was, I was just thinking when you were talking about that, I mean, how, from whose perspective, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, recur, for recur always has this thing, who's speaking of, you know, where are you speaking from? And, and who is speaking of, where, where is it coming from when you say that things have relationship to other things, even like, independent of the human? Because again, this is the point of, of uh, if you like, correlationist philosophy, that, that uh, uh, you know, even if there were dinosaurs on Earth before there were humans, uh, it's us now talking about them that somehow constitutes them as having that category. And, and I, I do think we can easily go too far and go to Merleau-Ponty and others and say there were no dinosaurs before mm. human beings because they, there weren't any human beings there to talk about them. Uh, but, and that therefore dinosaurs have some kind of dependent status starting from where we are now. But uh, and that kind of anti-realism very quickly takes over with correlationism. And I, and I agree with you, that's a very serious worry. But I, I would be afraid of going back to an anti-correlationist philosophy, which was sort of uh, just somehow pretending we weren't human and weren't taking a subjective point of view and was just sort of describing things as they really are, which, you know, people, that's what correlations, at least uh, accused uh, medieval metaphysics of doing, you know, with the making the rankings of the orders of angels or something entirely speculatively, without any reference to, as Kant said, what can we know? You know, so looking first of all to see what is it that we're capable of knowing, what is it we're capable of talking about, seems to be the, the, the modern qualification I think is important for correlation. Um, I'll just say, last, I'll just shut up after this because I mean, your, your, your talk was very rich and there's many things I'd like to comment on, but you know, obviously um, we'd be getting into the nitty gritty of different theorists and so on. Uh, you're, what, where you ended with this discussion of the fourfold and, and indeed your raising of different ones, I agree with you. I actually think that you need essences. So we've had this conversation before. Uh, uh, Anti-essentialism is very popular in business schools and oh. schools, even more so than in philosophy. Ah. So, <laughs> uh, essentialism, uh, uh, I, I think, it does go not just with realism, but you know, I think it's, it's a part of metaphysical uh, description of reality. Uh, so I, I endorse that. So and I, and I think uh, um, you know that that's something that I, I would applaud is in what you're doing uh, on the relationship on this sort of time space priority, if you like, and uh, as you say, why only those two? Um, uh, I'm not sure anyone has ever just thought of those two. I mean, even, uh, even when you get to Kant, you know, you have all the other categories that are needed for, for making something real. Uh, causation has to be in there alongside time and space, and then identity. You know, how things retain their, or are identical across time. And, and I think you touched actually on those issues, on those very deep metaphysical issues right through, that it is very difficult now, and there are a number of metaphysicians, both in the sort of analytic and in the continental tradition, that are trying to get away of talking about non-traditional entities, whether they be swarms or bees or, or uh, you know, how we even do identify a human person. And, you know, uh, right now you, you know, have a certain amount of oxygen in you, and, uh, you know, or you're carrying around microbes, uh, you know, uh, I got food poisoning in Naples last mm -hmm. week, so I've now probably, you know, it's me plus, you know, a large colony of parasites, uh, uh, they're in this room. So, you know, what, who, what's the, what's the me? Uh, you know, are we just as, as, there's a guy called Van Inwag, and I know you know Peter Van Inwag, and he sort of thinks we're a swarm, mm -hmm. that we as humans are a swarm of different layers of different kinds of microbes and, you know, uh, enzymes and things in your, and, you know, oxygen and all these things and uh, that that's a bit worrying too because in a way what ends up determining what metaphysically real could very easily turn out to be just the material constituents as determined by science uh, which you know would like to be found let's say in your bloodstream or whatever uh, and I'd be worried about that I mean it's the, that's kind of the scientific version of the plasma that you were talking about mm -hmm. or, uh, but anyway um, I was just thinking that I think that needs a description I don't know um, uh, if 
philosophers are uniquely qualified to do that. Um, so I think that metaphysics does need to be in, 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 in very careful relationship to the sciences uh, as to to try to find out what's really out there, as it were. But I do worry about trying to just have an objective account that doesn't take uh, care of how the subject is approaching it. That's, that's where it's at. That's great. Thank you very much, John. Um, Graham, if you'd like an opportunity to respond or... Sure. It was great to have Dermot respond to my paper. I've profited greatly from his books over the years. And to be specific, you're the one who finally got me to read Twardowski, which even Jan oh. Finlay hadn't tonight. That was a wonderfully profitable exercise from reading one of your books. Uh, I went ahead and did that. Uh, I've got about four points I might address here. I'm going in a random order. I've got this paper all covered. As far as time and space being accompanied by other things in Kant, I would still say that he has time and space together in the transcendental aesthetic. And he's got the categories as somewhat separate. And people still talk about space and time as a package. So I wonder why that segregation. Uh, and anyway, I think the heart of your response was about correlationism. And this is interesting because Mayasu, the one who invented this very useful concept, also agrees with you that we can't get past this. His solution is to say that we have to radicalize it into a kind of absolute knowledge, and he's got his own way of doing that. Whereas my reaction, uh, as well as that of a few of his other readers, was to say that it's not true that we're stuck inside of this correlational circle. And I, I would agree with you that we, we speak from a certain standpoint. We speak historically, for example. We can't say that we have direct access to the things themselves and that we're not conditioned by our, our, our where we're standing in the world. But I still think that's different from saying... It's not the same thing as saying we can only talk about talking, which is what I worry about in the correlationist standpoint. Um, I see, especially in analytic philosophy, there's this new tendency to speak about direct reference. You've got Kripke and other people who say we can point directly at things and talk about them. I like that. Um, why reduce the interaction between inanimate things to what people can say about them? I, I agree that any particular statements we make about inanimate objects will always be conditioned by who we are. But is it really true that we can't say anything at all about that interaction? Um, I mean, the scientists try to do that, but they do that by abstracting. Can't we, can't we do it by just taking another step back further and asking how do objects abstract, e abstract from each other as well, and not just us from them when we, when we describe them scientifically? Don't, don't fire and cotton abstract from each other when they, when they interact. I'm not sure this is a problem we'll be able to solve in this discussion, because it, it, it's a fault line that runs very deep in many philosophers, uh, whether or not we can get outside of this human world, world circle or not. Um, the only other thing I really disagreed with, I think, is when is when you say that you think Heidegger in the 1930s moves away from this opposition is too simplistic between ready to hand and present in hand. I'm not a great admirer of Heidegger in the 1930s, and I'm, I'm in the minority in that, I realize, and partly because I think he is repeating himself a lot there. I, I think it takes until after the war, the 1949 and then the 50s essays, when he really gets new, gets innovative again. Because I think uh, even though the artwork might have some sort of special status, it's still a special status between earth and world, which world later becomes sky in my reading. And so it's still the same opposition between, somewhat monotonous opposition between with the veiling and unveiling, I think. I think that's one of the problems with the 30s, is that this, this endless discussion of truth and how things are either hidden or revealed. Um, and so I'm not sure that he ever gets past that. And you have a fourfold, which ends up being built on the same twofold. He's just splitting the twofold in half. Uh, I noticed that you wrote some articles on the fourfold of medieval philosophy, uh, which I actually haven't read these, but I would be interested to read them. Um, I, Dermot's comments also reminded me that I forgot to make one terminological point that I should have, which is that objects is a negative term for Heidegger. It's a positive term for me. Object for Heidegger is what, what a thing is when you reduce it to how it's seen by you. Latour never uses the term at all, as far as, far as I can recall. He, he uses act, interact, or, or entelechy, which is more complicated, and I try to avoid that. But, um, uh, so objects, the term that I use positively from, from meaning things in their autonomy is the exact opposite of a Heidegger uses the term, simply because I think it's too valuable a word to give up, to sacrifice on the Heideggerian altar. Um, is there anything else in here I wanted to say? Um, oh, one thing about Husserl. I mean, you sound like you're more on Husserl's side in this disagreement with Heidegger, which doesn't surprise me, of course, but having read your stuff. Uh, um, that the, for Husserl, there's the life world. What Heidegger would probably say about this is that the Husserlian life world is still something that you can, in principle, look at. You can turn your attention to it. Is there anything really in the Husserlian life world that is, in principle, inaccessible to any sort of relation or any sort of conscious access? This is what a Heideggerian would probably say back to you, whereas the tools are always withdrawing from all access. Even when they break, there's still something hidden behind that breaking that you're not going to get to perfectly. And... Uh, I've heard plenty of people make good defenses of Husserl on this point. I wonder what you would say about this. 
up to the objection that the life world is always something in principle observable. If you just shift your attention. Uh, do you want to take your response? Um, well, I, <laughs> uh, that's a tough one, actually. Mm. But um, uh, I actually think I think if there's one thing that I think you're right about is that Heidegger tends to overemphasize this uh, revealing, perceiving uh, language. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's present even there in this discussion of tools that, that tools on their own, if you like, are embedded or hidden and you don't notice them up when you're using them and you, as you say, you, you have it sort of taken for granted kind of. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think Husserl describes the life world as having that taken for granted kind of. I mean, his, his, his notion of a life world is simply, uh, he thinks it never before been brought to our, it's so taken for granted mm -hmm. that we haven't thought about it. But, but it has a character which is very complicated, and it's the, precisely the one that influenced Heidegger. It's temporal character, and, and what, I, what Husserl calls horizons. It's horizonality. I mean, uh, all our experience has a sort of uh, contextual character, but it's also uh, it's set against some kind of receding horizon, temporal horizon, spatial horizon, cultural horizon, mm -hmm. linguistic horizon. And I think those notions of horizons, which as Husserl says, never get foregrounded. Right. They're always only in the background. That's why they're, they're not things that they're, they're the context for which we see things. They, they, I think, are the kind of haunted or the kind of hidden stuff in the life world that that I think inspires Heidegger, but it's yeah. also si similar to what Heidegger was looking for himself. Okay. Let me just ask one more thing. What do you think, if anything, Heidegger does beyond Husserl? Because I worry about a reading like Rudolf okay, Barnett's. It sounds like then Heidegger is Husserl. Yeah. 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 Heidegger is, Heidegger is the best Husserl or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, what Heidegger does uh, is two things. I mean, he, number one, um, as you know, I mean, as a sort of standard reading, is that he, he doesn't like Husserl's emphasis on consciousness because he thinks this is, uh, is too replete with uh, traditional uh, assumptions about uh, Cartesian split between consciousness and the world. So he gets rid of this in terms of this notion of das man mm -hmm. uh, or Dasein. And they're very, very difficult notions to articulate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, outside of terms like consciousness. One tends to slip back. So, if one could really break with Husserl and be a Heideggerian, you've got to use a new language here. And that's, I think, what some Heideggerians try to do. So, that's one of the things that Heidegger does. The, the other thing that Heidegger does, and Heidegger here uh, does really go beyond Husserl, but he acknowledges Husserl. Heidegger says he got thinking about ontology as a result of Husserl. So, you know, when Heidegger raises issues of being and so on, which Husserl doesn't really do, he really does bring in a new uh, perspective. But based on how things appear once we recognize the extraordinariness of the relationship to Dasein or to human beings or human character or whatever. That's what I would agree that too many Heideggerians are Husserl illiterate or Husserl too unsympathetic yeah. and want to uh, turn him into some conservative fossil that he's really not. They don't see as much in Husserl as is really there. Yeah, he so studied with him for 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, they went from daily walks and so he was, he, What happened was that you know, people want their heroes and they, they want to. There's many of these oppositions. Plato and Aristotle is yes. a good example. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so maybe this is a good point to throw it open to, to more general discussion and more general questions if anyone has a, has a question or a comment to make. Um, given that we're a very kind of heterogeneous bunch, maybe if anyone has comments, they might introduce themselves quickly before I just say where they're from. Just so we can second one. The second one, you can never be sure except by testing. You, you, before, it's very clear that you don't know how strong something is until you probe it and try to break it down. Um, so I guess other actions have to decide it. There's no magical register where the, where the strengths of actions and alliances are recorded. Um, and he's, in fact, very clear that sometimes very strong-seeming alliances and networks can be very weak. 
And he's brought in the notion of the plasma. We have to try to account for that. I, I don't like the notion of the plasma, to be honest, because I don't like this idea that there could be something unformatted that all the format springs from. This sounds too much like a bad part of pre-Socratic philosophy. Why, why is Latour so resistant to the idea that there could be real things with real forms outside of their relations? But he's very clear that uh, things take on specific character only in their interactions with other things. And what's below that is this kind of churning, formless matter that everything erupts from. And I think that you're not going to get what you need out of that. The first question is a little more involved, maybe. What, what is a mediator? What, how, is it, how does a mediator differ from an actant? Well, in a way, I suppose any actant has to be a mediator for Latour, uh, because you can't have an actant. An actant can't exist unless it's involved in an alliance of some sort. Uh, a non-relational <coughs> object would not exist. For the tour, uh, and so what I guess about, it what about his notion of intermediary? Is that not the distinction? The distinction between intermediary and mediator. In other words, that with an intermediary, it's like you know a process. No transformation takes place with the mediator. An actual transformation takes place. So he, he pitches mediator and intermediary within the same chapter as uh, in the assembly. So they're not acting themselves. Well, my reading of the tour is that there aren't really any intermediary. Sorry, any intermediaries that things can become relatively intermediaries by becoming smoothed down and less resistance. So you can smooth down the countryside with a highway, and you don't have to think about it so much. But then when your car breaks down, you have to think about being stranded in the countryside, going nowhere. And so you never fully reduce the resistance of mediators by turning them completely into interme intermediaries. I would say he's very clear that things can break at any time, things can resist you at any unexpected point. And so. I mean, can you think there are any examples in the, t in the tour of anything that's actually just an intermediary and not a mediator at all? Yeah, he has a whole chapter on it. In right, the wait, social, I, I just I read it too, but, I, but do you really, I mean, I, I read that as a relative term. I mean, yeah. how could you have an act in the tour that's not resisting at all? You could have one that's not resisting for the moment because it's been kept in place very delicately, yeah. but then it can resist at any moment, can it? it can no, it was when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about your earlier point about the accidents. Accidents. And accidents as being equivalent to in we were talking about the cause and influence of acc true accidents. Okay. Because with, with mediator you have a transformation taking place, it was a cause and influence. Right. With intermediary, there is no transformation. It's just a process. That's right. And somehow having accidental yeah, features. Yeah, it just started off. At, uh, yeah, yeah. You just reminded me of another link, which is that uh, I said in Grilla Metaphysics that metaphor also works best through accidents, which Max Black already noticed. That uh, if you say a pen is like a pencil, that's not really a metaphor, because it strikes too close to what is essential about the, what the essential use value of those two things. You need something accidental to create a metaphorical effect just as you do for causation in general as far as, and I can see what you mean, that, that um, uh, things happen when accident, things that are considered accidental were built. Um, so you might think a thing is just an intermediary and not a mediator, but then the certain aspects of, the, of that thing that have been forgotten might come back to haunt you. Um, uh, and I think in any technology that would happen, I mean, this, accidents happen. Accidents happen because the uh, solid fuel rocket booster explodes in the Challenger, that was considered a, Intermediary, maybe not the people who worked on it every day, but for the general public who never understood that there was some complicated technology in there, uh, what happened when that thing exploded is that suddenly it was, it was a mediator, and the mediator was resisting. Uh, so I can't think of any examples of any actants in the tool that would simply be pure intermediaries. They were only temporarily so. That's how I would read it. I had this discussion with Peter Airdale also, and he, he resisted it as well, but I just can't think of an example of an object that would have no mediating translating force for the tour. Because his whole point is that things get from one place to another only at great cost and only by a series of translations and risks. Maybe uh, a question still just to uh, follow up just on, on um, the point of correlation as an again. Um, okay. um, so so, in, so you, you want to look at um, more emphasis on, on say relationships between inanimate objects. Yes. Um, so it's also you're talking about some part of a non-anthropocentric philosophy, right? Um, and give, and you accept that there's obviously no um, direct access to the essential object. There's always a translation involved, right? So, um, but it's something I'm wondering: to, to how far can we go with this in the sense of, you know, how do we talk about the world at all? 
and I'm say, I'm a big fan of Hubert Dreyfus's critique of artificial intelligence in the sense that you know one of the reasons we can make sense of each other, we make sense of the world, is that we share an embodied experience of the world, which we, we share particular practices, which which allow us then to develop communicative devices to to compare our experience. This is what makes this kind of communication possible. So I'm wondering then, you know, where where that doesn't apply when we don't. When, when, when we're embodied in a different way from a kind of a, a, an inanimate object, how can we, you know, where can we get, you know, so the first aspect of the question is this in terms of to what, to what, ex, what kind of progress do you think we can make in that area? And, and secondly, in terms of treating all the relations, do you think it's more interesting to, to, to treat all these, you know, inanimate objects the same as the, the human object relation? And so I suppose the second question then is a more kind of practical question in, in sort of, you know, why is this most in, more interesting in the sense of, you know, can you give us examples, or maybe you're not that far with it yet in terms of, of, of illustrations, in terms of how, how, how this becomes interesting, you know, over and above the kind of Latourian type of... Um, my response on the second point uh, is that I'm not saying it's more interesting, I'm just saying it's part of what's interesting, and philosophy mm -hmm. has abandoned that part mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. We have a situation now where philosophy sort of inhabits a ghetto, a kind of human-centered ghetto, where we think we can only talk about situations when humans are involved, and uh, we let the natural sciences deal with these inanimate situations or other disciplines, and then we're, we're besieged in this castle, and the cognitive sciences come and want to take even that away from us, and we're going to have nothing left. Why not be able to talk about nature just as the sciences do, but in a different way? Um, is it really so clear that the sciences talk about inanimate objects in an adequate way? They are objectifying things, right? They are. Reducing things to properties. I mean, I love, I'm a huge fan of the sciences. I go to the science section of the bookstore before I go to the philosophy section these days. Uh, but why did I not become a scientist? What, it's not giving me something that I want, which is the metaphysical dimension. Which is what are, what are the things outside of their relations, outside of their visible qualities? And we can ask that about inanimate things just as we can about things that receive from human visibility. So I, I don't think it's more interesting. In fact, the human part is always going to be more interesting to us because we're humans. We might have less to say about fires and dust than we do about humans. But they at least have to be part of the picture, or else we're going to have an artificial sense of, of what humans are. I would see human relations to the world as a special case of less developed, less advanced ones, and that's why I'm, I'm warming to panpsychism a bit. I, I criticized it in that book, but I'm warming to it a bit. I'm, I'm seeing these people as more kindred in spirit than other people, uh, reductionists, for example. And for your first question, I've forgotten. The first question was about the ability to, to, to say anything about about relations that involve entities <coughs> which are um, which occupy different completely different forms of existence. So it's, you know the, the reason we can communicate together is we, we share practice, we share an embodied being in the world and, uh, and and so we can we can develop a language that means that things make sense to us. But in terms of how do we how do we bridge that gap where we're, we're, we're talking about relationships between objects that, uh, that we've no sense of their being? My answer to that is that I'm never sure why the dividing line on that question is between humans and non-humans, because isn't there also a challenge involved in understanding other cultures, or understanding people from a different historical era, or even understanding ourselves? I mean, why, do, why does psychoanalysis exist? It's because it's hard to understand ourselves. Um, and so, uh, I think there's always a puzzle in trying to understand something that's not ourselves or even ourselves. Um, and I think that's, that's, a new, that's an ineliminable problem, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's an inanimate thing or another person or another culture. Is it really true that we can only talk about ourselves? Um, okay, you could say that humans share a life world and that's why we are able to communicate, but don't we also share a life world with pets to a certain extent? We might not share language with them, but we also don't share everything with tribes living in jungles who haven't heard of airplanes or natural sciences or, or climate change or these sorts of things, and yet we're still able to come to some understanding with them, aren't we? Why is the human-non-human -human divide the magical one where understanding is no longer possible? This is what I wonder about. Uh, and it brings me to think about, it, it sounds like defining lines of alienation and relation. Now I'm coming from psychology, so my, all my terminology is uh, not philosophical one. But uh, so you were saying we, we don't have a contact with certain objects in the world. And so as you're defining the lines of alienation versus relation, then you know you have people, both <coughs> individuals and cultures, that have a very intimate um, 
relationship with um, different trees, etc., and, and some with, uh, and maybe yeah. adding quite on this. Yeah, you see, that's another point, and since I can understand quite, you know, in terms of our relationship with trees and our relationship with, with these sort of things, but it's the relationship of a tree with a tree, or a stone with a, with a tree. How, how can we say anything about that? We might not be able to get into many details, but we can at least formalize generally what happens when an object meets another. And of course, we can never be in the we can never be in the place of either of those trees, so we have no idea what the tree is going to experience. Maybe, maybe no idea is an exaggeration. Right? I'm not so sure that we have no idea what it's like to be a bat. Uh, uh, I've toyed with this term, speculative psychology. There, sh there should be a philosophical discipline called speculative psychology, where we try to imagine ourselves into a, a stone or into a into a piece of grass. Well, that's mysticism. Mysticism, not scientific. I'm not sure. I wonder if there's some way we can do this. Just well, it has been done. I mean, this is the origin of scientific psychology. It's trying to integrate the whole introspection. Okay, or in theater and method acting, I guess you can try to. Poetry. Act, act. Poetry, okay. It, it exists. It's just maybe not the term. Maybe not as like. scientific as we would want. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that is not part of the problem that, th that there are many ways of, of people who being or different forms of discourse that try to articulate thing thing relations and uh, Bachelard, you know, has written all kinds of stuff about fire and stones. And as you say, there's there's um, both artworks and you know, if you listen to a lot of artists, they just say, well, I just wanted to bring out the stoneness of the stone. Even the Heidegger would say that <coughs> is what art does. So um, the problem is that. Since science has become the measure of all things, mm -hmm. you know, it's you, you, you know, what makes that any more true about stones than than what uh, geology says? So, you know, the right. problem is is to, and I quite, I actually have sympathy for what you're saying that there ought to, that we shouldn't let scientists have the last word on thing thing relations, and I think you know, I, I think scientists have to reflect themselves on, on where they're coming from in talking about thing thing relations and, and, and what kinds of limits there are on it. Um, I think, though, that we have to be equally careful not to just plunge into it. Uh, you know, uh, speculative, speculative. Uh, what do you call it? Speculative, speculative psychology. Spe speculative yeah, psychology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, it's it's in a way it's you know it's what phenomenology was proposing. And you mentioned this yourself. I mean, eidetic variation. The very idea of it was you start from what, from your perspective and you try to alter it. Uh, ascent, you know, in, in certain features and see how far it gets. I mean, so you, as you say, you could imagine what it's like to be a bat or, you know, if you could imagine that your main sense of for finding things was echo, echoes or something like that, you could probably replicate it to a degree, small degree. It won't give you what it feels like to have leathery wings, but, but you know, you might need to do that separately. But, <laughs> but, but you know, it's, there's, no, there's no reason why you couldn't have all of that. The trouble is that there's no check on it. You'd That's true. To, you'd have to have bats telling us so well, you got that wrong. Is a, is a very fundamental mm. human quality. So again, it would be the filter through which you experience any relationship between two non-human um, entities. Well, what about two human entities? Isn't the historical imagination something very tricky? I, I was just reading one of these pop history books on the airplane from Amsterdam about uh, the Gothic invasion of the eastern, uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire in the 300s. and. That person did a lot of work to reconstruct what the culture was like at the time, and I learned a lot from it. I felt like I was entering a world I had never entered before, and that takes a lot of skill. Mm. And I'm inclined to think that's really different in degree from trying to think your way into an animal. I, I realize that we have, I have more in common with these Roman Empire emperors than I do with a dog, mm. but isn't, isn't it really just a difference in degree to try to think your way into something that you are not? Why this magical divide between the human and the non-human? This is what I think about. You're a psychologist. You know this. It's hard to think your way into another person, isn't it? Definitely, and it, I mean, it, one could argue that you can do the checks and validations, but then again, this is very limited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and on the other hand, I have a brother who is an archaeologist who all the time brings me, and archaeology is in an interesting place because it's between humanities and sciences, and of course sciences, you can have bigger budgets, much more sexy. So there is a trend of moving towards it, but um, a, a lot, there's a lot of, um, conjectures there, and a lot of uh, they imagined. You find a bone, you find something, and you build a whole structure 
what, where does it fit uh, based on the horizons uh, kind of concept mm -hmm. that you mentioned before? Um, and, and you know, somebody with different horizons would have different um, conclusion based on the same artifact. Mm -hmm. so. But you don't necessarily have to discuss thing thing relations to see how one thing experiences. Um, don't, do you think all vaults occupy a similar fastener world uh, in the way they perform some function in, in a larger um, complex, for instance? Um, so the relationship between the vault and the bridge is not based on how the vault experiences the bridge, but what the what role the bolt plays in, in the bigger assemblage, right. or is that just? Yeah, you can you can do that. And I'm, I'm thinking about Roblox still because that, that lecture really affected me. It's horrified me in a way that I've never been horrified before. I don't know how many of you were there the other night, but <coughs> but we can look backwards and we will visualize the industrial revolution a lot differently now. Now that I visualize it as the pumping of CO2 into the atmosphere in a way that was going to destroy everybody uh, later, we humans were obviously completely unaware of that. But it makes sense to interpret human activity in that sense in the 1820s, doesn't it? Doesn't it make some sense to? So is that you're talking about bolts? In other words, you're understanding bolts by the effects they have, not just by how they experience. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't necessarily have to talk about the experience of a bolt of a bridge. There may be a, a, a wider category that's not quite so right. anthropomorphic, but it's appropriate for talking about the relationship between a bolt and a bridge, or that, a bolt and a nut. Or and enough. Nuts. Okay. And I suppose this is true of anything historical as well, because anybody could write a book about any of us a thousand years from now and it's going to say shocking things, but is they're going to have a totally different context for our lives and our actions than, than we ever had. And so our lives are not reducible even to self consciousness and self awareness of what our lives is what lives are. Um, mm -hmm. and that applies equally well to our own objects. You're right. You're right. It's just that I suppose we're focusing on the experience of inanimate objects simply because it seems so strange to us, and so it's, a, it's an attention grabber to talk about what a bolt feels when it's in a network. But, but yeah. also because we only think of relations as involving humans. And they, you know, we only think of relations as between humans and things, and therefore we use characteristics from that relationship to discuss the other relationship. Okay. That'd be a mediator then. Well, maybe, maybe this is a good point to, to call it close to, to um, this afternoon's proceedings. So uh, just to remind you again that, um, that there'll be um, on 2 o'clock on Monday, there's a workshop, which is a much more kind of open event in terms of if anyone wants to bring particular problems or particular issues, they're drafting it or we deliberately uh, gave, um, put it on either side of the weekend so people have a bit of time to cogitate over uh, some, some of the issues that, um, that we discussed today. Um, so everyone is very welcome again to come back on, on Monday too. Um, also, just before we I close up, I just want to um, say uh, just a few words of thanks to, to some of the main kind of contributions here. First of all, um, to Padre Scully over there, who has been largely in the background, ready to hand today, but is basically the main initiator and and, or, and the person behind in terms of, of, of initiated, organised, and, and did everything to make this event happen. So thanks very much, uh, Padre, for, for that. Um, also, of course, to Dermot um, for also yeah. from the very early <coughs> supporting and, and participating and responding. Uh, and also, of course, to all your colleagues in the philosophy department who we in the business who leech off uh, by attending your lectures. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful for, for us to have colleagues like you who, uh, who allow us um, all this and uh, participate on the periphery. Um, and, and finally, I think um, to Graham for uh, a wonderful talk and uh, for such an engaging um, discussion afterwards. The discussion will be continuing as well uh, this, this afternoon. We'll be reconvening in Botticelli's in, Tem in Temple Bar at 6 6.30 yeah. for dinner and uh, a few beers and that sort of thing. Um, so everyone is, is welcome to, to come and join us if anyone uh, would like to, to, to continue some of these discussions in a more informal context a bit later on. I just want to say one last thing, which is having given several dozen of these, I can honestly say that I've never been treated so well at an institution as here at UCD. It's remarkable. It's almost been embarrassing at times. 
I've been posting about this on my blog the last few days. So <laughs> wonderful <laughs> treatment I've been seeing here. We love the public accounts yeah. committee after. Yeah. <laughs> 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 don't, don't say don't say you got any team this week. <laughs> 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 I'm going to slip off and I just see it there. I need a mobile by the way, just in case things go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Well, right.